Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Scotia iTrades webinars. Today's topic is on combining technical and fundamental analysis with the market guys. You may have noticed that we are using a new webinar platform. It's called GoToWebinar. And if you are experiencing audio difficulties, you can click on that sound check link in your audio panel highlighted there. And also, the setup window may show up on your secondary screen. As always, everyone is muted for sound quality purposes. And you also have the option of joining us by telephone. If you do, don't forget to enter that access code as well as the audio pin from the audio panel as well. Let's just do a quick audio test. If you can hear me clearly and the sound quality is great on your end, please click on the hand icon located in your toolbar. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. And just as a reminder that Scotia iTrade does not provide investment or tax advice or recommendations, and nothing in this presentation is or should be construed as investment or tax advice or recommendation to buy, sell, or hold any security or to follow any particular investment strategy. Today's presentation, as with all of our presentation, is strictly for educational purposes only. So you did get a chance to use um, the hand icon from the toolbar. You'll also notice there are a few other icons available to you. One is the arrow icon. That really just allows you to show or hide the control panel. Sometimes it does cover some of the information on your screen. So feel free to move that along or aside so that you're able to see the information. Also, of course, the full screen icon if you want to view in full screen mode. And the hand icon, of course, if you want to uh, raise your hand to ask a question or just get our attention. And of course, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in in the Q&A panel in that field right there. And AJ, our presenter, will address them as they come in or at the end of the session. And we are recording today's session, and if you did select yes on the registration page, we will email you the recording. Alternatively, you can access our past webinar recordings on our Webinars on Demand page under the Learn and Do More section of scotiaitrade.com. You are also welcome to take notes. However, I will make today's presentation available for you to download at the end of the session. I do want to make a note that the presentation um, slide will not be available until the end of the session, and it will show up in the handouts panel, as you see here, as a link. So you'll be able to download that only at the end of the session. And our presenter today is AJ Monte. He's a chartered market technician with over 30 years of experience in the financial industry. He currently serves as chief market strategist for the market guys, teaching professionals and novices alike innovative techniques to accumulate and protect wealth. He's also one of the more recognized financial experts in the industry, thanks to his appearances on ABC, Fox Business, and PBS Television, as well as a regular guest slot on Sirius Money Radio. AJ has authored two financial education books and is known internationally for his financial educational seminars. Welcome, AJ. Thank you very much, Rose, and welcome everyone to today's session, which is combining technical and fundamental analysis. What I'd like to do is I'll switch to the full screen mode here so that you can see exactly what I'm talking about. And um, Please remember that for those who are listening to the live session right now, you have the ability to ask questions. And again, I encourage you to do so. It'll help you get the answers you're looking for. And at the same time, it will help others who might have the same question but just aren't asking it. So you're doing everyone a favor by doing so. I just have to do a check. Rose, can you see my control panel or do you just see the technical analysis PowerPoint? Just the slides. Okay, good. All right, just had to make sure there. Um, before I get into the content, I'd like to show you this slide. And you know, some of you are saying, "Oh boy, here we go, the legal jargon." Uh, but as I was putting this presentation together, I wanted to point out something that's very important, and it's towards the bottom of the the slide here where it talks about such decisions. You see that right there? Let me just get my pen here so I can highlight that for you. Such decisions should be based solely on your evaluation of the financial circumstances. Now, that is not just a slide uh, to disclaim any you know, responsibility on our part to manage your account. You, you are in full control of the decisions that you make. And this presentation is designed to help you make the decisions that you need to make, of course, with your money. 
but do it in such a way where it's going to help you increase the odds in your favor and at the same time reduce the risk and everyone has a different way of looking at risk some people have a higher tolerance for risk while others have a very low tolerance and they get out of the market as soon as something starts going against them um, I just saw there was a okay you can see the slides but not the presentation mode okay I uh, just want to make sure I got a, a message. Uh, are we seeing the screen still okay, Rose? We are, but we're only seeing the title page. We're not actually seeing the presentation as you're going through. Huh, interesting. Okay, I have to find out what's going on there. If you're using two monitors, it might be just focused on the other monitor. That's probably what's happening. Well, I'm, I'm not using two. Let's see. Okay. Let's, let's move that and see if I can get that going. All right. If if you want to click on play, I can see the play button. Maybe that might help. And then you can work through the slides. Uh, you see you see the screen's changing now? No, not at all. Oh, interesting. All right, let me get out of this mode and see if, uh, if this is better. Can you see the screens now? You're on technical analysis, but it's there. You're moving now. Okay. All right. I'm, ju I'm just going to leave it on this slide here. It doesn't matter if you see the slides on the side. It'll just give everyone a guide as to where we're going. Um, but this is the slide I was talking about with regard to the decisions that you make. Now, when I, when I first started trading, I did not have the access to education and seminars. I mean, the Internet wasn't even invented yet and we had only a limited number of books to rely on for getting the information and we had to learn from our experiences and back then in the early 80s you had to take risk in order to learn and you learned from your mistakes now fortunately for you you're learning from <laughs> the mistakes that I've made over the past 34 years and my goal is to help steer you away from those same mistakes but I don't want you to to be so fearful as to not take any action in the market so understand yourself your feelings your risk tolerances and weigh that into the equation before you get into any stock and what what I am going to do is show you how to use technical analysis and fundamental analysis together as a tool to pick the best stocks and also how to minimize your risk in the process. So in order for me to do this, I have to define what technical analysis really is. And it's simply uh, being able to forecast future price movements based on what's happened in the past. And it's, it's kind of like weather forecasting. And for those of you who uh, follow my weekly market report, by the way, that's a free report that you can get from me each week. You just go to the Market Guys website and put your email address in there. You don't even have to put your name, but it will be mailed to you. Each and every week, I forecast the market, and there's no one in the world that does a better job of this with regard to the percentage of accuracy than the record I'm currently tracking. And two weeks ago, I compared this to weather forecasting, and I actually showed uh, a, a screen with weather, weather radar where I was tracking a storm front that had just left the west coast of Florida and living in Florida uh, it's important that people keep their eye on the weather maps uh, it just so happens I do have some expertise as a, as a pilot my degree is in aerospace so p weather analysis was a very big part of the curriculum and still is very important when you're flying of course uh, but what I did is I, I learned how to take what I learned in forecasting weather and apply that to the financial markets and what I found is that there's an uncanny uh, number of similarities between weather and price movement and I, th I think that may be one of the reasons uh, why my percentages are so high because I'm able to look at the past to determine what the future is and it's it, it goes along with Newton's law uh, you know a body in motion tends to stay in motion unless 
affected by an outside force. And if you have momentum moving in a certain direction, unless an outside force is pushing that trend, it'll continue on its path. And that's exactly what technical analysis is. Now, I am going to talk more about fundamental analysis first, but I want you to know that in my analysis, I always look at the charts first. So in other words, I'll present the fundamental concepts, but it's not the way I start my checklist. I always start with the technical analysis first, and hopefully that'll help you save some time as well. Now, the pros uh, the, the, of technical analysis is that it really gives you some insight as to what the institutions are doing. You could, you could easily see and track their volume and more or less put two and two together to say, okay, the institutions are buying today. Uh, volume is up, price is up. That tells me there's a tendency that the institutions, the professionals are moving the market. So that's a big pro. And it also, uh, technical analysis helps investors determine when to buy or sell. That, that word when is extremely important and keep that in mind when we eventually move to the fundamental analysis of what we're doing here. So it helps investors determine when to buy or sell and it's also dynamic. Every second or less prices are changing and you don't have to wait for that to update. The way the technology is today we have a great benefit in the tools that we use, particularly the folks at Scotia, you have the trade desk, uh, flight, the, the trade desk and, and uh, flight desk rather, and that is that is something that is really uh, a, something I never had uh, early on in my career. I had to do it all by hand. You have computers doing it for you, so it's very very efficient with regard to time management, and it's effective as well. Now. Whether some, whether some of the cons of technical analysis, well, it, it can become too noisy if you use too many indicators. And what I mean by that is, is that if you have too much data on your chart, you will confuse the signal. And in some cases, you won't even be able to find the price action. That's a true story. I was doing a seminar in Boston, Massachusetts one, one day, and... There were, there were almost a thousand people in the room and we had taken a lunch break and I'm starting to move off the stage and a gentleman comes out of the audience with his computer in hand and he said, AJ, can you do me a favor, can you take a look at this one stock for me? And that, that's quite common for people to ask me what, you know, I, what my, my ideas are on their stocks. But I looked at his charts on his, on his laptop and I, I immediately laughed and I I hope he didn't take offense to that. I don't think he did, but I laughed because when I looked at his charts, he had Bollinger Bands, uh, he had uh, RSI, he had stochastics, he had volume indicators, moving average, convergence, divergence. He had all this. It looked like a plate of spaghetti, and even me, I had a hard time finding where the actual price was on the chart. And I said, "Well, there's your, there's." One thing I could tell you is to remove all these indicators and just look at the price and look at volume. So it can, it, too much data can create an environment of confusion because of all the noise, and that's what I mean by that. Now, again, another con, and it's the reason why you're on a Scotia webinar to begin with, but technical analysis, it takes time to learn this. It takes practice. It takes dedicated hours of looking at charts every single day. Hopefully you're doing this out of enjoyment and not out of necessity. And it really is a lot of fun when you approach it the, the correct way. Uh, another thing that really leads me um, in the con column here is that technical analysis leads to a crowded room of experts. And what I mean by that is you could have a group of analysts in a room looking at the same charts but every analyst might have a different thing that they look at. And I've seen this uh, quite often, actually. And I, I see one person promoting Bollinger Bands. And I see another person putting more weight into the relative strength index. And whether you know what I'm talking about here or not, my point is that our opinions 
can actually be translated as you're looking into the chart. So in other words, if you have an opinion, you can look at a chart and find any signal that's going to back up your opinion, and that's what you stick with. So everyone becomes an expert in that particular indicator, but our opinions mean nothing. And, and so you have to be able to control that. Okay, so I don't see any questions yet, so I, I see that uh, we're, we're moving ahead again. If you have any questions, feel free to put those right in there. Now, fundamental analysis is, and, and I'm basically paraphrasing myself here because I know you could read, and I don't have to dictate this slide to you, but I want to elaborate on what this slide is all about. It's, it's really the definition of what fundamental analysis is, but it's, it's the, it's the uh, analysis of underlying forces that will affect a company and the price of that company's stock. And you may have turned on BNN and you have an analyst looking at a particular bit of information that the company put out. It might be forward earnings forecasts. It might be uh, an analyst's opinion about a stock. And the data that we get on this underlying company will actually help us determine what the fair value of the stock might be when you compare it to the rest of the industry or the rest of the market or the rest of the world economies, whatever that may be. And the challenge with that is that your perception of value might be different than my perception of value. Here's an example. You might say, I will invest in MCD. Anyone know what ticker symbol MCD stands for? Who, who wants to answer that? I know there's a delay in the Q&A box there, but ticker symbol MCD. You might invest in MCD because you see value in their new product that they just released. I might look at MCD, which is McDonald's, by the way, and I might say I'm not looking at the product at all. I'm looking at how they're managing their debt. Or I'm looking at their, their leaders to see what their expansion plans are, you see? So my value interpretation is different than yours, but ultimately your idea of what value is is going to allow you to get in or out of the stock based on your own opinion from the data that you're collecting. I don't want to confuse this because this really isn't that difficult. Now, when I am looking at fundamental analysis, you have to understand that there's pros and cons there as well. The pros are institutions rely heavily on this type of analysis. For years and years, I have been a technical uh, I've been a technical <laughs> analysis advocate. I have always believed that price is price and that the charts are nothing more than a historic record of the price. And for many years, I would battle the fundamental analysis and, and people who are analysts who only look at fundamental uh, numbers. And they're going to say, oh, those charts, that you, you can't predict the market with that. And I would get into these debates not to say technical analysis is better than fundamental, but I would tell people it's a tool. It's simply a tool that you can use in conjunction with the data that you're pulling out of the market. But to this day, institutions rely heavily on fundamental, more so than the technical. Uh, another, and, and why is that a pro? Because if they're moving a lot of money into a particular stock because of what they're seeing on the fundamental reports, and you're along that stock because you're seeing different signals that got you long, that movement of money into that company's stock is going to help you. So that's a pro. Now, the other thing is investors uh, determine which stocks to buy based on fundamental analysis. Remember when I said in technical analysis, the charts tell us when to buy or sell, but the fundamentals tell us which stocks to buy and sell. And, uh, of course, one of the other pros is that it's great for financial programming. Let's face it, they wouldn't have much to talk about on the financial news networks if there weren't any fundamental data to talk about, earnings uh, and debt and everything else that goes along with that. So it does make for great financial content. Uh, some of the cons, it's very delayed. 
um, for the most part, the average investor does not get the fundamental updates for a month at a time or sometimes a quarter at a time, as, as you'll soon see in my examples. Um, and, and also, it's very open to interpretation. You know, opinions, again, get in based on, oh, I don't think their debt-to-equity ratio is that bad, while another person will debate on that same point in the opposite direction. And as a result of that, and, you know, I, I, I use this word um, cautiously, um, fundamental analysis opens uh, itself up to manipulation. It is, the numbers are easily manipulated. And what I mean by that is, and we've seen it all the time, and yes, I do believe there's a lot of manipulation, but the good thing for us is if we're a savvy investor and we know how to translate the data, it's only going to work in our favor. I, I just feel sorry for the unsuspecting investor who goes in with a, a, a naive approach and trusting all the numbers all the time. Here's an example. Uh, a company might come out with an earnings estimate, uh, a forecast of, let's say, uh, 13 cents. Now, it, in, in most cases, it's not even the company that makes the earnings forecast. It's the analyst that's looking at that company that makes the forecast. And they say, okay, we're expecting 13 cents on earnings. And that analyst might be lowballing the number. They, they, they might actually believe 18 cents, but they're stating 13 cents. So then when the company actually comes out with an earnings report of 18 cents, what happens to the stock? Who knows that answer? We've seen it all the time where the company exceeds earnings expectation and the price goes through the roof. Well, guess what? A lot of the analysts that report on these companies actually hold positions in these companies. It's not against the law to do that. As long as they state that they're holding a position, they could say whatever they want. The general public is clear that they own or are selling that stock. So the numbers can be manipulated, and that's, again, one of the detriments of, of the data being released, and especially when it's, it's uh, delayed, it puts uh, certain people at a disadvantage. Okay, now, remember what I said before. Technical and fundamental analysis are tools that we use together, together. And the reason we use these together is not to make money first, but to minimize risk first and make money second. And I know many of you are listening to this presentation because you want to make more money, right? Well, the fact is, if you want to make a lot more money, you have to learn how to lose a lot less money when you're wrong. That's the whole part of screening for stocks. Now, you see, a screening process is, is underlined here on, on my chart there. Um, I don't know if I will have time towards the end to go through the screening tools, but Scotia does have very sophisticated screening tools that you can use. Please uh, take time and explore those on the website. Go through the stock screening tools that they have. And feel free to plug in some of the numbers that I'm about to give you when you're using the stock screening tools because the computer will spit out a list of stocks that meet the criteria that you set in those screening filters. So again, very, very important that you learn how to use the tools and again, especially knowing which numbers to plug into those tools. All right, so I'm, I'm still scanning for questions. I don't see any looking good. Everyone okay? You still awake? Good. All right. I'm having a good time. I don't talk about fundamental analysis all that much because there's so much interest in technical analysis. But when I do talk about fundamentals, I still try to keep it simple. Now, I pause there for a second because keeping it super simple is the KISS process that we follow with the market guys. And when we start crunching the numbers here, like we see on the screen, I'm going to invite you to think about your own personal finances as we're going through these numbers, all right? Especially price to earnings ratios, debt to equity ratios and such. 
And the reason I want you to think about your own personal finances is because it will allow you to understand the importance behind these numbers and why they should be used when you're looking for a stock. Here's the first one. One, two, three, four. I'm going to go right through the numbers. The P-E ratio, and again, for some of you this is pretty basic, but I want to show you why looking at a P-E ratio is so important. Don't just take that for granted because people, you know, they throw the P-E ratios around assuming everyone knows how it works. But even as simple as this calculation is, people tend to get confused about how to actually use it. You know, all right, there's the number. What do I do with it? Well, the price to earnings ratio is simply the price of the stock divided by the earnings of the company. Okay? So it's a report. The the um, the price earnings ratio, and I'm using an example here. Let's say the price of a stock is is fifty dollars, and the twelve month uh, trailing uh, PE is what we're go going for here. But let's say the company has stated an earnings of two dollars. We take fifty, divide that by two, we get a PE ratio of twenty five. Now. Watch what happens on the next slide. Same idea of taking the P-E ratio, the price divided by earnings, and look what happens when I increase the earnings. Ready? The price of the stock still stays the same, but all of a sudden the company is making more money in earnings. Now they doubled their earnings, and what happened to the P-E? The P-E dropped from 25 to 12 and a half. See, so what that means is a lower P.E. ratio tends to give us the best bargain stocks. And in a moment here, I'm going to show you some real life numbers uh, from the market that I got this morning from the Wall Street Journal on the general indices and how they rank with regard to their P.E.s. So what happens is um, we, we tend to overlook this, but there's also an important part of the calculation that a lot of people have a look and and we're in that state right now now watch this formula right the price is now going to change the earnings is going to remain the same we're going to keep that at four dollars but the price of the stock now goes up to two hundred earnings remains the same the price of the stock is rallying for whatever reason look what happens to the PE it went from twelve and a half to 50. So the, the PE of 50 is now telling us, watch out now. You know, the price might be a little overbought here. Earnings hasn't changed. There might be some news out here that got people some, you know, some people excited. But the PE is way overboard right now. So what happens is the people that invest in stocks fundamentally might start moving out of a particular stock because the PE is getting too high and the high PE simply represents either the earnings have dropped or the price has gone up without an increase in earnings and so they're going to get out and a lot of people do invest this way and you could screen for stocks that way as well now this is you see the date on top there it's August 25th I just pulled this this morning at 1026 and I threw the slide in there to try to get the most current data now uh, for, for those who are listening to the recording of this, obviously that date you see on the top is going to be far further off from where you are in, in the future. We're getting into time travel here, so I better stop that. <laughs> um, but what you might want to do is go on the Internet and look at the, the major indexes, the indices, and, and look at their current P-E ratios. Now, the way this works is, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, uh, hopefully you can see my cursor here. Rose, can you see my cursor moving around the Dow Industrial right there? So I make yes. sure. Okay, good. Okay, so the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is, uh, they calculate the PE quite regularly, and what they do is they take all the stocks in the Dow and they average the PE ratios for those stocks. Now here's a good example of what I just showed you and that a year ago the Dow Industrial Average PE was 15.59 
a year later, current time, that P.E. ratio is up about 30% of what it was last year. Now, what does that tell you? What does that tell you? Think about the formula I just gave you. It means either the prices have gone too high relative to the earnings that remain the same, or the earnings have dropped in the companies while the price remained the same. You see? So this tells us, be careful. If you're seeing a 30% increase in P.E. over a 12-month period, the markets just may be in an overextended or overbought condition. Now, look at the Dow transportation stocks. A little bit different story there now, isn't it? Look at that. Last year, 17.3. This year, current time, 12.69. See, so now, if you're comparing all of these indices here, and you say, okay, I'm thinking about investing. Do I invest in the Dow Industrials? Do I invest in the Dow Transportation Stocks or the Dow Utilities? You could see that the Dow Jones, the utilities have gone up tremendously. Look at this. From 16, roughly 16, to almost 28 in 12-month period. Now, what this tells me is that I may not want to get into the utility companies. And I may not even want to get into the industrial companies, but the transportation stocks look a lot more appealing to me. See, so I'm weighing this into the equation, and I haven't even gotten to the charts yet. Now, remember, I don't want to confuse anybody, but I always start with the charts first to see what the trends are, and then I go to the fundamentals and crunch the numbers there. Now, some of the other indexes is the net. Oh, Oh, what happened there? I just lost that. There we go. Some of the other indexes is uh, the Dow, uh, the Nasdaq 100, gone up, but not too much, and the S&P 500 has gone up. Now, the Nasdaq stocks and Nasdaq 100 don't look that bad when you compare the increase in PE to the rest of the markets out there. Again, it, it steers me in a certain direction that allows me to be a little bit more comfortable knowing that, you know, the earnings are supporting my idea and the price is relatively cheap compared to where the earnings are trading right now. Now, the debt to equity ratio, and I want to talk about this. This is where I want to bring in your own personal financial uh, situation, whatever it may be. From your experience, Let's, let's uh, plug in some numbers here. Let's say uh, that your debt, let's say that your credit card debt, uh, your automobile payments, you know, the car payments, whatever it may be, you've taken on $300,000 in debt. And let's say that your net worth, including your house and everything, is about a million dollars. What that does is when you divide the debt by the equity number, you get a ratio. In this example, it's 0 0.30. Now, on a personal level, that might be a lot of debt for most people. If your net worth, net worth is, on, is a million and your debt is 300000 or roughly a third of your net worth, that might put you in an uncomfortable situation. But when you're talking about business, and investing in that business. This is a, a fairly low number, actually. But keep that in mind. Again, compare your own financial state to the way companies are being run, and you'll see that th this is another way to look at it. If we, if we look at the drawing board here, um, this gives you an idea of how the ratios work. So uh, why am I showing you this? Well, because when you're screening for stocks, you may not want to look for companies that have too low of a, P, of a, a debt to equity ratio because it, again as you see it, it tells us that the management is unwilling to take risk. And that might be a, a, a company that's you know growing fairly steadily but maybe not growing fast enough to keep up with the inflation numbers for you as an investor. Now a, a, a ratio of 1.0 tells us that the, the amount of debt is equal to the equity that they have in the company, you see? And that's a, that's a fairly average number, actually. Um, but when you're getting greater than 2.0, that means the company's borrowing a lot. 
to finance operations. Now that's a I don't normally go. This is my personal preference. I normally don't look for stocks that have uh, ratios over 0.75. That's my comfort zone. Um, greater than 2.0, you will see a lot of um, credit card companies like Visa. They're leveraged, um, but for, for even industrial stocks, you have to be careful because if a company is borrowing twice as much as what their equity is showing and they get into any kind of a financial situation where they can't manage the debt or maintain the, the debt, then they're at risk of going bankrupt, actually. If you don't have enough coming in to finance your debt, that's, that's got trouble written all over it. And again, if I, if I go to your personal finances and I say, okay, you've borrowed twice as much as what you're worth, what kind of credit score are you going to have at that point? Chances are your credit score is going to be very low because you are a high risk category now. So again, the, the lower the ratio, the lower the debt that company is actually holding. Okay, any other questions? No questions, I'll proceed. Now, this is uh, a, a number uh, that unfortunately a lot of people, uh, they, they tend to overlook but it is one of those things that you actually can plug into a stock screener. And I, I like low debt to income ratios. It's the same formula as what we saw at debt to equity and PE and all that. You're basically taking your debt and dividing it by your income. And um, what, what happens here, what this means is you have debt, but how much of that debt uh, or how do you measure that debt relative to the income you're taking in? Now, here's the example I would use for your own household. Let's say that you're carrying, um, let's say you're carrying, uh, again, 300000 in debt, and all of a sudden your $100,000 a year income has been cut in half for whatever reason. I'm, again, I'm using this as an example. When you were making three hundred thousand a year, or a hundred thousand a year, or uh, enough to maintain the minimum payments on your debt payments, that is, you, you could function. But if all of a sudden your income is sliced in half, but your debt remains the same or goes higher, that is a sign of trouble. And a lot of people actually get themselves into this predicament where they've taken on so much credit card debt that they could barely make the minimum payment on that credit card. And again, credit companies look at that and Experian and some of the other ones, Equifax, and these are the companies in the U.S., they actually measure someone's personal debt relative to their income or ability to finance a debt, and they give them a score. So when you're investing in a company, why wouldn't you do that on your own and look at that company to determine whether or not they are good risk or bad risk? for your investments. You see, again, this is something that's overlooked quite often uh, and now that, that I brought that to your attention, hopefully you're now gonna, you're gonna start looking at that. Okay, this is another one that a lot of people don't know how to interpret, but it's something that I look at all of the time and it's basically institutional ownership. Institutional ownership includes the banks, uh, life insurance companies, uh, money managers, mutual funds. These are the professional investors that invest client money or bank money into a particular company. And it is required that it's reported to the general public. Unfortunately, the general public gets this information very, very late and I should say it's extremely delayed. This is, this is, an, actual, um, this is an actual report that I pulled this morning, right around 10.30 again, on Facebook, ticker symbol FB. And you can see, <clears throat> excuse me, you can see that the price of the stock is just over $124 a share. Now let me break this down for you. This report, and I'm using Yahoo uh, Finance as my source because it's pretty generic. 
and I won't offend anybody by using Yahoo, I'm sure. Um, Scotia has uh, reports that you can pull up on, on your website as well. There are detailed company reports that will give you this information, uh, but I'm breaking it down into its simplest form so you know what to look for. And that will be under the holders. Who, who is actually holding the stock? Now, you can see here that 4% of the shares are held by the insiders and owners, which in my opinion is not a lot, actually. That's a pretty low number. 4% of the company is actually held by the owners or the, the insiders that, that created this company uh, in the very beginning. And you could also see that the percentage of institutions and mutual fund holders that are holding it. And then there's a breakdown of the percentage of the float. Now let me explain to you what the float is. There are two types of stocks. There's the public stock that comes out, the, the, the shares uh, outstanding, uh, which uh, are, are basically the shares that stay in a total number of shares that are traded minus, um, the float is the shares outstanding minus the treasury stock. So treasury stock is the stock the company itself holds in an account as an asset. So when you take those shares away from the total shares outstanding, what you're left with is the float. And you can see here that 71.49% is held by the institutions and that there are over 1,400 institutions holding the shares. Now, why is that important? Well, here's why it's important, and I'll, sh I'll show you on the next slide. These are the actual top institutional holders for Facebook. And FMR, LLC, look at that. you got Vanguard, huge company, State Street Corporation, one of the largest mutual co fund companies around, T. Rowe Price, you may have seen or heard about them, BlackRock. These are huge, huge institutions. J.P. Morgan, look at that. Bank of New York, Mellon Corporate, these are huge, huge companies, and they are holding Facebook in their accounts. And it shows the value and number of shares that they are currently controlling. You see? Now, here's what I said it's delayed reporting. The last time they reported was June 29th. So, here's why this information is important and why you should, you should screen for it. If Vanguard is one of the top institutions that are holding this stock, Vanguard could easily help themselves out by telling their analyst to upgrade the stock. Notice that long pause of silence. Well, think about this. You might say, well, that's unethical. It's nothing illegal about it. They can do that. They just have to disclose that they're holding it. They, many times they don't tell you exactly how many shares, they tell you how they're holding it. The U.S. Congress uh, back in 2008 re requires companies now to report uh, what they hold before they make uh, an, an analytical report or, or make a recommendation on stock. So Vanguard could say it, can go out there and State Street a Corporation and T. Rowe Price can go out there and, and tell all their analysts go upgrade the stock. What happens when they upgrade the stock? Can anyone tell me? Yeah, type it into the Q&A box there. What happens most times when a company analyst upgrades the stock? The price of the stock goes up, right? So all of a sudden the price of the stock goes up and they sell into it. Oh, it happens all the time. That might actually get you a little upset, but it happens all of the time. As long as they're stating it, nothing wrong with it. So who gets who gets caught holding the bag, the unsuspecting investor that doesn't know how to translate this information. See, if I know that Vanguard is holding, you know, uh, nine, almost 16, um, what is that, that's 16, I can't see, it's so small. But if, if you see that holding 139 million shares of the stock, that's $15 billion. Wow then you know that something is up. 
if they're holding that many shares and you see on the news that they just made an upgrade, there's no way I'm going to be buying it. So going back to this last slide here, all right, I, am, I, I, will, I will definitely look for stocks that have about 70% ownership, but when I look for stocks like that, I am now waiting for them to upgrade. And as soon as they upgrade, I sell it. So I'll continue to hold it as long as it's 70, 71, 72. But if, if anything happens where there's an upgrade, I know how to use this information to get out. And that, that's how you actually do it, just like that. Okay, now let's get to uh, what I love the most, and that's the charts. The technical analysis, remember what I said, it's dynamic. I said that on the first or second slide. It's dynamic. You, you can have your charts up right now and it's going to move. I love the simple moving averages. Now, for those of you who follow, who've been following along for the past couple of months, you may have heard me say that I'm building on the content. So this is a concept that I spoke about a couple of months ago, but I'm building on it now. See, we're adding this concept on top of the fundamental ideas and being able to screen for a stock. And the simple moving average is it's, it's one of the most basic averages, and it's simply the average price of the stock over X number of days. It could be days, weeks, or months, whatever period you select. And so when you throw these moving averages on a chart, you will see that they react differently under different time frames. And again, I'm, I'm almost hoping that there's some questions that come up uh, here on this because it tells me that you're getting it, number one, but I want to make sure I'm clarifying this for everyone. You see, the, the 200 period moving average is the red line. Now, that moving average is extremely important to long-term investors. And, and what I mean by that is as long as the stock is over the 200-day moving average, most investors will stay with that position right there. As long as the stock stays over that red line, they're good. You could also screen for this. If you're looking for stocks with low debt-to-equity ratios, if you're looking at companies that have low uh, debt to income ratios or low PE ratios, you put that in the screener, but then you could screen for stocks that are greater than, the stock price is greater than the 200 period moving average, you see? And then when you put all this data into your stock screener, it'll give you a list of stocks that you can then pick from, and from there you narrow the list down to the ones you're ultimately going to invest in or trade in. So the 200 period moving average is more for the investor. The 50 day moving average and the 20 day moving average, the black line and the blue line here, are more for the intermediate swing traders because their time frames are shorter and therefore they want the moving average to be a little bit more sensitive. In other words, they want the moving average to be trading closer to the price so they can make better decisions there. And then the five and the 10 day moving average, a lot of times the, the day traders will look at those. They're, they're extremely sensitive. They move almost with the stock, but there are signals that are given off. And believe me, I'm not gonna get into the minute details of how to use the moving averages uh, for trading per se, but I will touch on the concepts and how you can use them, particularly for risk management. Here's, here's one idea. If you see the five-day moving average, which is represented in the red line, crossing over the 20-period moving average, that might be a, a buy signal for you. Again, that's, it, that is, of course, if all the fundamental data is in line with what you're looking for on your shopping list. But the check is, I'm not going to buy this until the moving average, the five day is crossed over the 20. And if the, if the five day crosses below the 20, that'll be my trigger point to get out. Remember what I said, I'm, I'm repeating some of these things because I know they're important. Fundamental analysis tells us which stocks to buy or sell, right? But the technical 
analysis tells us when to buy and sell. So I am only going to buy when that moving average is crossed over the other moving average. Or I'm only going to sell when the 5 crosses below the 20. Now I could simplify this even more by just putting one moving average up there. And when in doing this, I don't I don't look at any other moving average compared to the 20 day moving average. I look at the price and how it compares to the moving average. And again, this is something that you can screen for. You know, price greater than x x x moving average, whatever moving average you put in. So if the price is moving over the moving average, I'm bullish on that stock. As soon as it drops below, I'm bearish. And that's pretty straightforward. You know, I had for years I had a television show on PBS. The name of the program is called Wealth and Wisdom. And I had a gentleman by the name of Jim Rawbach. I haven't spoken to him in years. He was he was well into his eighties when I had him on the show. I, I hope he's still around. I don't know. I haven't talking spoken to Jim in a real long time. Um, but Jim at the time was named the Zen, the Zen, Z E N, of market timers. And we, for the whole program, discussed what he did to become the best stock picker in the whole world. And he said, AJ, all I do, and he says, I know this is going to sound almost ridiculously simple, but all I do is I buy the stock when it goes over the 20 and I sell it when it goes below the 20. That's all I do. And I'm the number one stock picker in the world. Yeah, that's all he does or did. And so I love that simplicity. That was a message that rang loud and clear for me. I love that simplicity. And so I teach that KISS method. You know, there are some little things, little fine-tuning uh, activities and ideas that you can apply to this. But the basic premise is that when the price moves over and closes above the 20, you buy it. When it closes below the 20, you sell it. Or you put a stop, or you put a price alert, whatever it may be. You get in and out based on where the price is relative to the moving average. And let me tell you, folks, this takes a huge amount of weight off your shoulders when you know it's time for you to to have to make a decision and you know I, I always talk about the emotions and I think this is the perfect time to bring it up because if you are using these tools the way you should it and, and you have a plan in place just like I mentioned the part of the plan is you know, I'm going to buy it when it goes over the 20. I'm going to sell it when it goes below the 20. That's part of the plan. Another part of the plan is I am going to do a good job each and every week searching for stocks that have low PE values or have low debt because I know that if companies have a lot of debt and interest rates start going up like I think they will, then the cost to carry that debt is going to be a burden to those companies who have so much of it. You see? So that's part of the plan. And the, number two, selling is predetermined. I just told you, if the price goes below the 20, you sell it. It's not, you're not making that decision in the heat of the moment when all, it looks like all heck is breaking loose and you don't know what to do. It's very, very clear. You know exactly what you're going to do before you do it. And again, that takes the pressure off of your shoulders. The other part is, number three, the losses are kept within your overall risk tolerance. Remember what I said at the very beginning. Your, your perception of how much risk you want to take or how much you can tolerate is different than the person next to you. And it's different than how much risk I'm willing to take. And, and so you have to learn how to control these feelings and bring it into a black and white method that's very clear. There's no gray area. And when, and when you have that clarity and the simplicity behind the system, it, it gets fun. I, I tell you, I, I, I can only w wish and hope that each one of you enjoy this part. Because you're, we're, we're emotional beings. I talk about this quite often. 
It's, it's not your lack of knowledge that's your greatest enemy. It's your emotions that are going to get in the way. We all know that. And so when, when I uh, teach people, whether it be on a person, you know, one-on-one -on -one level or in group sessions like we're doing right now, I, I can only hope again that my enthusiasm, my excitement, my passion for what we're talking about here is coming through to you. Because I, I'm going to confess something to you. It's, it's personal. I've said it maybe a couple of times on previous sessions. But listen, if you were talking to me only about making money, that wouldn't excite me. Not at all, because I've, I've done that over the years. My wife and I have made very smart decisions over the years. But if you start talking to me about what money can do for people in their lives, now I get pumped up. That, that's why I get so excited about teaching you these concepts, because I, I envision you being able to retire comfortably. I, I envision you having even more money than you need to be able to help the people closest to you who might be in need. You, you, you don't know, folks. I, I've traveled around the world, and I've seen people in really, really bad financial situations, and we are, we're just so blessed to have these tools and to have this market the way it is because it's so predictable when you're looking at the right signals. If, you, if you're just going on that emotional uh, you know, incentive, uh, and you're just following the talking heads on BNN, you're not going to have fun with this. It's going to be stressful. So I hope you've enjoyed this session. I, I certainly did presenting it to you. Um, one thing I'm going to leave up here is my email address. If you have any questions about the content that I've given you, Robert, um, you know, email me that question you had about gold. I'm not going to tell you when to buy it or when to sell, but I can definitely give you the technicals and the fundamentals on that one to help you out. But you want to learn how to put the odds in your favor because that's how the professionals make money for the companies they work for. They put the odds in their favor and they're not the only ones doing this. You know, when I was a professional trader for many years, I had trading managers looking over my shoulder all of the time to make sure I wasn't taking on too much risk for the company I was trading for. See, you have to do that for yourself. You have to be your own risk manager because ultimately you are responsible for your profits and your losses. You can't blame that on anyone else. No one is trading your money. No one is hitting the buy button or sell button on your computer. You're doing it. But if you do it comfortably without the pressure of the emotions weighing on your shoulders and it's clear and, and it's concise, oh, the sky's the limit, folks. I'm absolutely telling you. So, Rose, I didn't have time to get to live charts this time, but maybe next time we'll, we'll do that again. I'm going to pass it back to you. If you take the controls back and wrap it up and give everyone a copy of this presentation, I'd really appreciate it. And, again, thank you, Rose. I, I like working with you. It's great. No problem, AJ. Thank you. So next you can access our webinar recordings on our website. And you can go to Webinars on Demand, Learn and Do More, scotiaitree.com. Also, don't forget to fill out our survey. It will show up after you exit today's session. So please ensure to do that so that we can better meet your needs. Also, don't forget to mark your calendars. Next Thursday, September 1st at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, we have our How to Get Started with Scotia Eye Trade. And we actually do go over that equity screener that AJ did mention. So we will go over that uh, during this webinar if you want to learn more. Also, AJ joins us again on Thursday, September 8th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time to present on 20 period moving average method. And also, for the first time in a really long time, we are offering French webinars. On Tuesday, September 6th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, we are presenting on options as a hedging strategy by the Montreal Exchange. And Friday, September 23rd, we have our How to Get Started with Scotia Eye Trade. And also, Thursday, September 29th, we have Horizons ETFs joining us to present on ETFs 101. And feel free to sign up for other webinars on our, under our seminar and webinar calendar under the Learn and Do More section. And of course, under that webinars on demand section is our past webinar recordings. And I want to thank AJ for sharing his insights and thank you all for joining us. And I will make the handout available for you um, soon. Let me just copy that over. And if you can think of any other questions after today's session, feel free to send them along to education at scotiaitrade.com, and we would be happy to forward that to AJ. And there you have it.
presentation slides are available for you to download in the handouts panel. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day. Thanks, AJ.